Hello everybody, in this video series I'm going to be showing you how I made this Rubo workbench. I'm sorry, 22 minutes. I can imagine the look of despair on your face when you see that. This video has come out extremely long. Extremely long for what it is. I'm only installing hardware here, but apparently there's a lot to do, which I didn't realize until I started editing it. Well, anyway, welcome to part six of the Rubo Workbench series. As I said, in this one, I'm installing hardware. So this is the leg vise, and look, I decided to mess around with the frame rate of my camera here. Look how amazing this looks. Basically matching the rotational speed of the force in a bit. Quality looks a bit rubbish, but you know, look at that. It's like slow motion, fast motion drilling. So this is the cavity for the crisscross hardware. As you can see, that's the dodgy mortise on the front left leg, just below there. And this cavity sort of negotiates, not negotiates, navigates around that so it doesn't break through. So that was just drilling out the waste and then clear out the side walls with a router bit using a fence. The bench crafting instructions are pretty comprehensive and by comprehensive I mean it's like 10 pages long per bit of hardware which is rather tiresome to read so um, I'm not going to go over every last detail but I pretty much followed them exactly down to the T in terms of measurements and everything. So this is the nut that goes through the leg and I also have to drill out a clearance hole for a bushing. Now here I went to turn the camera on and realised that I turned it off. But there's the end result after the hole saw. The reason I did the middle hole first, then the hole saw, and then the middle hole again is because if I did the hole saw first, the pilot hole would leave a hole that's too big for the pointy bit on the forcing bit to engage in. So I had to drill down about an inch, then swap over to the hole saw, use that spur point in the middle to locate the pilot drill on the hole saw, and then go back into that pre-drilled hole as I am here. And the walls obviously give location to that without needing the spur in the middle to locate it. Difficult to explain, but this is the problem that I had when drilling out something in the other videos. I can't remember what it was. But there you go, so forcing a bit isn't long enough to go through the entire leg, so I measured extremely carefully and drilled from both sides and got it pretty much spot on, I am pleased to say. And then the barbarian in me came out again and started smashing out the waste with a chisel. I'm loving it in this project, just hitting bits of wood and cracking them out. It's, it's extremely satisfying to do five years of furniture making and then just smash bits of wood out like this. Obviously I couldn't leave it like that though, I had to clean it up with a router afterwards. And it was around this point that my ST card ran out of storage, so I had to switch to using my phone, so these are horrible camera angles films at 60 fps as opposed to 24 so that's why everything looks a bit weird and smooth and the color looks a bit dreadful as well so i'm sorry about that of course this happened while installing pretty much the main part of the workbench but here we go so that is the bracket that accepts the crisscross just poke me some center holes for the bolts to run through into the wood drill out a pilot hole using the drill guide and then using a tap, I thread it into the wood to accept the bolts that hold that bracket in place.
go, there's the reinforcement plate and there's the bracket at the top of the mortise. Now the next job was the hand wheel. Now I've got a line there where I can line the hand wheel up top to bottom. However, the side to side location is the difficult part of this. So what I did, push the hand wheel all the way to the left, mark a dot, all the way to the right, mark a dot, and then put it halfway between those dots. And then I know that the hand wheel is located perfectly central in the hole top to bottom and perfectly central right to left. So there you go, about, what's that, four mil? Four mil, done. We go crisscross bracket in place and then the bushing it was just a pain to film this but essentially what I did mark a center line on that leg line that top screw up with that central line and then screw all those bits in place with even spacing round push the chop against the leg which would give the location the nut and then screw that all in place and you get a working bench craft advice do not follow my instructions on this. I wanted to make this really nice and comprehensive, but the camera setup just completely ruined it. So I'm sorry about that, but we're back to 24 FPS now, which is good. I remembered to empty my memory cards. So from this point, apparently the rest of the video is all on the tail vice, so I didn't realize it's actually that long. So these are the stub tenons on the end of the workbench where the end cap is gonna be joined. I wanted to cut a small shoulder here so that I didn't have to rely on getting the mortise perfectly flat against that split top in the middle. So bringing that tenon back a little bit gives me a just gives me an opportunity to hide it a little bit better. Essentially, hide it in the end cap. With that shoulder cut it's going to clean it up later now was the time to assemble the tail vise which was quite fun actually so firstly you put a bit of oil on the shafty bit oi oi. then you put a washer on and then you put the flange the flange on and then you put the hand wheel on and then you get a little pin thing and you've got a smooth end and a bit with some grooves on it you put the smooth end in push it in as far as it goes apparently it's quite loose there and then you start hitting it with a hammer and that bottoms it out and then you've just got to get it central for the aesthetics I suppose and that is your tail vise pretty much assembled or at least the hand wheel part of it. And then you just got attached the sliding carriage together. So that's just putting the nut block onto the plate, screw it down with the supplied bolts. Now here I'm working out the overall size of the cavity. So what I did, screw that sliding carriage onto the thread to pretty much its maximum size and then measure how far out that hand wheel is going to be mounted. So my end cap is going to be 75 mil thick. So as you can see, it sticks out 75 mil. And then on the other end, I can put a small line where the maximum length of that cavity needs to be. Annoyingly, it hit that dog hole, but it's all hidden. It's all hidden, so it's fine. No one will see it. Just don't look under the workbench if you ever see it in person, because it's, it's it, yeah. Yeah. So now I'm just marking the boundaries for this cavity. It's a lot of material to hog out, so I'm gonna make those lines as visible as possible. So create a knife line with the marking gauge and then go over that with a pen line. So that marked out the inside wall of that cavity. And the only thing now was to mark the depth. Now to find out how deep you need to cut that cavity, you need to mark from the top of the workbench. Obviously the workbench is flipped over at this point, so I am actually working from the top there. The reason you have to mark from the top is so that the hand wheel, once it is all assembled, falls below the surface of the workbench. If you drill it too high, then that hand wheel is going to be poking up above the surface of the workbench. And if you start planing bits of timber, you run the risk of smashing your plane against that hand wheel, which would not be very pretty. 
I want some more barbarianism. Yes. Smash out more waste with a chisel. Bevel edged Lynelson chisels. Anyone want to send me a mortise chisel? Please feel free. Please feel free? Please feel free. Please would be equally as appreciated. But. Then move on to the ever so trusty router and clear the rest of that waste out, getting a lovely flat bottom and clean edges on it. So then with that all cut out, I could test the fit of the block. Didn't fit, great. So I had to take a little bit of material out of that other side and that would keep the screw holes for the dog block central in that slot. If I started taking material out of that left hand side of that cavity, it shifts the screw holes to the left and it means that the dog block that is going to be screwed into the vise would not be screwed centrally. So it wouldn't be a massive issue, but it just wouldn't be as strong. But look at that mess that it made. Sharp bit, pretty shavings, but what a mess. Now here I'm cutting the shoulders on the stub tenon to their final length. I'm just going to do that with the sliding table and the fence. Get the fence set up to the position that I need it to, use that as a stop, measure the blade to the height that I need it to cut, and then using that fence as a butt, as a butt. <laughs> uh, using that fence to butt up against, slide the wood through the saw, flip it over, cut the other side, and that gives perfect alignment between the two shoulders. Then I could cut away the remaining material that the jigsaw left over from earlier on. the end cap. Massive slab of walnut. This is about 80 quid's worth. Three inches thick. Yeah, not cheap. Don't want to be cocking this one up, do I? So first step, face side, face edge. So with that face side and face edge established, I could then accurately saw off the disgusting bits of that material, in this case, that massive knot on the edge there. So I saw that off, get the edge replaned, lovely and flat, take it back to the rip saw, cut it to just over its final width, and then shove that through the thicknesser. With that all plain square, grain was all visible now, so I picked the nicest parts for the face side, face edge. So on the outside, I had a lovely bit of straight grain, and on the top, it was really nice and swirly, so pretty much perfect, really nice contrast. And now I'm setting up the mortise gauge against that stub tenon, and I'll be marking that on the end cap, registering from the bottom of it, and this means that the bottom will be perfectly flush and there'll be a small step on top of the workbench that I can plane off later. Just makes that clean up a little bit easier. So it means that I can plane upright as opposed to upside down, which wouldn't be great. And again, to hog out the material in that end cap, apparently I chose the mankiest force the bit I could possibly find. 
set the depth stop to what I needed, so in this case the depth of the stub tenon, and get drilling. Now at this point, my SD card store has run out again, <laughs> so I had to switch to the GoPro this time. Now this is why everything's really wide angle. God, I did not do well here. <laughs> Essentially, what I'm now doing is routing out the grooves for the bars on the wagon vice to be recessed into. So my measurements were a tad oversized here, so what it meant is that when I put the tracks in, I had a bit of wobble in that wagon. So to get rid of that, I just pinched in the tracks using bits of veneer to space it inwards, and that would snug it up on the sliding plate and reduce that side to side movement to pretty much zero, and keep everything in perfect alignment. Here I am marking out where to drill that hole in the end cap. Benchcrafted supply a template for this that you can overlay on the end cap and drill into it. However, my workbench being a little bit different, I wasn't able to use this for the side to side location. Could have used it for the top to bottom location, however, I then realised that I didn't actually print my instructions one to one scale, so that would have been utterly useless and I couldn't be bothered to go back to the computer to reprint it. So, marked it all out by hand and eye and then drilled a bigger hole for a washer and then this one I'm drilling now is for the thread to go through. Now the next bit of work on the end cap was to recess the remainder of those bars into it. So I put those in the groove wherever they were meant to be, marked it all with a knife line, drilled out that waste as per usual, smashed it out with a chisel and then flattened the bottoms with the router plane. Now to allow for wood expansion and contraction, the end cap is only glued on the dovetails at either end of the workbench. The middle part of the end cap is held in place with bolts. Benchcrafted recommends using sort of coach screw type things, but I thought, nope, I'm going to use threaded inserts and proper M12 bolts. So drilled the hole, here's the insert, I've just put a little bit of candle wax on it first, and then these just go into the wood, tighten it with a massive allen key and then that gives you a proper thread into the wood. And to mark and drill the corresponding holes, just mark the centre line of those inserts, transferred that up to the top of the workbench, 
pop the end cap on and then transfer those lines back around the front of the end cap and that would give me the location to drill the holes. Now again, I need to allow for expansion and contraction here. So what I did is got that line and marked five millimeters either side of it and then drilled those two points out. What this did is create an oval hole and that would allow the bolts to slide side to side as the wood expands and contracts. And now I'm just final fitting that stub tendon into the mortise. It was a little bit too snug at this point and wasn't quite closing up on the final millimeter. So just taking away bits of material, testing the end cap on it. If it didn't fit, take off a little bit more material, test the fit until it closed up perfectly at the end. And there we go, that's the end cap all fitted, drilled and everything. Have a look at the little silly I had here. As you can see, down in the split top, there is a small gap where I drilled out too much material. I'll plug that a bit later, it'll be fine. Just pretend you didn't see that bit. Anyway, thank you ever so much for watching. If you're on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever, follow me on there, say hello, and yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.